physics teacher at Snyder in Fort Wayne. I'm a technology coordinator for the district, which means I kind of help teachers integrate technology in classrooms. I'm the director of esports at Snyder, and I'm on the board of directors for Indiana Esports Network, which is uh, something I'll talk about in a minute. So I come wearing just a few hats, uh, but I wouldn't have it any other way. So let me get this set up, and uh, we'll talk about what I'm going to do for that, hopefully. And then hopefully we have time for questions at the end. I mean, I don't want to be a very formal presenter. I'm a, I'm a high school teacher. If I'm not being interrupted, then it'll be weird. So uh, if you have any questions, just feel free to go ahead and interrupt me and ask what we're doing. It'll be just fine. So I wanted to take uh, a little bit of time. First of all, it's a little nice vacation to get, a, to get away from teaching. I brought my wife, so she gets a video record me see a part of my life that she doesn't normally get to experience. But uh, these are the four areas I wanted to talk with you about this morning. Just a general what is esports. Um, some of you probably have a background, some of you might not. But we'll kind of start at a basic level of what it is. Uh, more importantly, why should it matter to you as schools, individuals, and employees instead of just to the community at large. I will talk a little bit about what high school esports looks like in the state of Indiana and across the country. And then I'll show you a little bit about what we've done at Snyder, just as kind of a, a case study example. So first, what is eSports? Um, I don't like reading slides to people. I'll, I'll make these available to anyone who wants them. My contact info will be on the last slide. Uh, but very generally, eSports is a competitive environment centered around video games. Uh, it's highly organized. The games range from MOBAs, which are multiplayer online battle arenas, to first-person shooters, to Minecraft, to Tetris. Um, and everything in between. Uh, just like traditional sports, we have teams on rosters wearing jerseys, competing in practices and competitions. So uh, the, the best mindset to be in is it's a complete analogy to a traditional sport. It's just instead of using football as the vehicle for that, we're using a video game. Here's a, a general timeline. Esports as a competitive activity has been around for maybe a lot longer than you realize. The first world championship for a video game was back in the 70s, uh, and it's progressed since then. Started back in arcades um, and some basic home consoles, but we've progressed since then. Uh, nowadays, eSports is one of the largest professional gaming communities or professional sports communities in the country. And I've got some data on that, but I'll show you in a second. Uh, just how big is eSports? Uh, in 2019, it hit $1.1 billion in revenue across the world. Uh, it's one of the fastest growing markets for any professional sport, uh, especially in places like Asia, but also in the U.S. as well. Uh, there are about 440 million fans worldwide of esports, professional esports. Uh, most, most companies that you think of are invested in esports in some way. Uh, the general insurance companies, right, uh, now owns NRG, one of the largest gaming corporations in the, in the world, in the country. So you're seeing companies become invested in this. This is a picture of the League of Legends World Championships. I mean, we have esports competitions at the world level filling 40,000 seat arenas. So it's exactly like you would think of in traditional sports that exists in esports too. Here's some projections that were done. Uh, pretty soon, if that has already happened, esports is gonna be the second largest professional sports like category in the country, behind only the NFL. There, and there are traditional sport companies and organizations becoming integrated in the esports community as well. Um, the NBA is doing this really heavily with NBA 2K. The Indiana Pacers have a professional team that they sponsor, as do a lot of NBA teams. So there's a lot of crossover between these as well. And the reason for that is really the demographic, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, as kind of a, an example, for the League of Legends World Championships last year in 2021, there were 4 million peak viewers and 174 million hours watched of this tournament. So we're, we're not talking about small numbers of people across, like little segments of a demographic. We're talking about major sporting events. And one of the key things is, it's among younger demographics. The younger demographics that aren't watching the NFL or professional sports anymore are watching these it's the fastest growing segment around 18 to 34 year olds. 
And there's prize money involved. So this was from last year, some prize money tournaments. Uh, Dota 2 is an old MOBA, a lot of people still play. It's still the largest generating revenue tournament that there is. There was $285 million awarded last year for Dota 2 tournaments. Uh, I mean, some of these, even the 37th one, Super Smash Brothers Melee, which, you know, is a few generations old now, is still awarding $3.5 million a year in prize money for tournaments. But it's not just professionals that are doing it, it's content creators and streamers as well. Uh, there are people who are streaming themselves playing video games, making $20,000 a month from Twitch ads and revenue, just from getting on and streaming. Uh, Ninja is probably one of the biggest. He reports about $300,000 a month from Twitch streaming revenue. And Twitch is uh, kind of like akin to YouTube, but specifically centered on esports and gaming. Here's some data from uh, over the summer, I believe. I think this was the month of July. What people are watching on Twitch. That first number that's a little hard to see is the number of uh, like concurrent viewers. So on a normal day, we're talking about 300,000 viewers. That last number is hours watched in a month. 60 million hours watched for some of these top categories of games on Twitch. It's what students are doing. It's the engagement that they're experiencing that's not maybe how it has been before. So that's great and all. Professional esports is big, there's lots of money, there's lots of people involved with it, but why should it matter to us? And this is really why I'm here. Um, think of all the reasons that we as educators or as school-based professionals like traditional extracurricular activities. Right? And they're for these reasons. We're, we're promoting competitive opportunities, we're giving them leadership opportunities, uh, enhancing a sense of community is a really big one that we'll hit on. Um, the dynamic storylines, scholarship possibilities, which we'll cover as well. The thing to really realize is all those same reasons that we love sports, like increasing attendance and academics and grades, behavior. There's actually a study um, from the NCES that says if a student participates in an extracurricular activity in high school, they're 29% more likely to get a college diploma than they are if they don't. That was one of the statistics that really blew me away. Uh, but what we're seeing is, I don't know about in your schools, but at least in Cyber and Fort Wayne, a large percentage of our students weren't involved in extracurricular activities. Something like 40 to 45 percent did nothing outside of normal school. So esports kind of fills a, a niche that wasn't existing in traditional extracurricular offerings. It's for those students who didn't feel like they were band students, who weren't football players, who didn't really fit in anywhere else, but they fit in with esports. All those same reasons we love traditional sports apply to esports. Just for the kids that maybe really need it and weren't getting that service somewhere else. Uh, even more than traditional sports, traditional sports tend to be segmented in demographics, based on age, based on gender, based on geographic location and physical ability. Esports are not. Esports are a great equalizer. Um, in our program at Snyder, we have about 33% minority students. We have about 20% non-male students, and they're all playing together. There's no segregation based on ability level, or even based on financial uh, commitment. We offer the program free 100% students which a lot of other extracurricular groups can't do either. We can talk about that later as well. Um, this is some of the, the data that's really kind of crazy to me. And this is some that we gathered across the country. 84% of students nationally who are participating in esports said they never had a place that they really fit in before they joined esports. 84%. That's a large segment of students that we're just completely missing if we're not offering something we see um, huge gains in performance in school and in athletics and academics. So as an example at Snyder, one of my favorite statistics to share is last year after our tryouts, we had about 100 students involved in our program. Um, about 30 were failing at least one class. Um, at Snyder, if you're failing a class, you don't get to play. You're on academic probation with one F or with two more Ds. Uh, so after our call-out meeting, we conveyed that information. Within two weeks, 100% of them were passed. We had 30 students increase their Fs to at least these to pass if they were eligible. Within two weeks. We have students who were failing seven classes their freshman year. We said, we're going to offer eSports. Uh, one of my graduating seniors now is up to like a 3.2 GPA. 
taking summer classes to get it up, because he wants to go to college on an esports scholarship. Just because we're offering this opportunity to them. What are kids playing in high school? These are some of the most, most popular titles that we see in the high school space. Um, Rocket League is pretty big, especially in the state of Indiana. Um, I would put up Indiana's high school Rocket League players against anyone in the country, and we fare pretty well. I'm maybe a little biased, but that's not. <laughs> I think that's true. Uh, League of Legends has a complicated relationship in the high school space, but uh, Riot made some good decisions recently, at least from my perspective, so you'll see League of Legends making a comeback. Uh, unfortunately, Blizzard is going the other direction, so Overwatch is not quite as popular as it used to be in high school. Uh, what are the opportunities for students? Uh, this is really big as well. NACE, which is kind of the national governing body for collegiate esports, has 250 member colleges and universities. Uh, almost all of them offer scholarships for esports, ranging from $800 to $8,000 a year, just for playing esports, on top of everything else. Uh, the average scholarship for an esports student is about $2,400 to one of these major universities. Uh, in total, there's between $16 and $20 million a year devoted just to esports scholarships for incoming college students. So we're, a lot of schools are seeing untapped. They can't fill their rosters because there aren't a lot of high schools yet getting on board with having organized programs. I can tell you having an organized program to have colleges recruit from is a gigantic benefit to our students. We signed three college or three graduating seniors last year for college scholarships. Uh, and those scholarships and opportunities are not just for players. There are colleges offering scholarships for shoutcasters to do broadcasting, for social media content creators. It's not just about playing the game, it's about an environment around the competition that fosters all sorts of opportunities. <laughs> Here's some uh, colleges and universities, at least up by me and Fort Wayne, that have programs. Um, if you can think of a college in the state of Indiana, they probably have a program to some extent. Uh, even smaller schools like, like Grace College, Franklin College, these smaller private schools have programs as well. And a lot of them are looking to fill rosters. Like I said, it's not just players. There are tons of potential careers in these sports. Uh, this is not even an exhaustive list, this is just a few of them. We have students even at Snyder that are doing these sorts of activities now. So we integrate with our journalism program and have student journalists write articles for the newspaper, for the website. We integrate with our psychology program and have students talk about sports psychology and performance anxiety. Um, we integrate with the digital content side, with digital design. So, Esports is, is a segment of an extracurricular, but it, it's much wider than that in its scope. We're tying into these like authentic learning experiences in all sorts of classroom environments that have now an outlet that students are interested in. Uh, Oklahoma University actually has the degree in shoutcasting now. You can go just like you would get a degree in broadcast journalism. You can get a degree in shoutcasting in particular um, and be a degree in shoutcaster. There are lots of professional organizations hiring for shoutcasting. So this is a way for students to get a leg up. Okay, more granular. So that's kind of why it should matter to us as educators. What does it look like here in the state of Indiana and across the country in terms of high schools? The state is a little bit old, uh, but you know, there was a global pandemic that kind of made data collection hard. Uh, as of 2019, this is where most schools stood in terms of esports involvement. 75% not organized participation at all, had a thought much about it. Uh, there was only about 4% of the schools in Indiana that had a competitive esports team, another 8% or so that had some sort of club. Uh, but I would argue that these numbers haven't changed all that much. Um, there's still a lot of schools that haven't really considered what it looks like. Uh, maybe they kind of thought about it. But um, as a state org, we see about 90 school districts in the state that have some sort of involvement. So there's kind of two areas of thought on what esports looks like in a school environment. Um, there's state competition and national competition. So there are several national uh, organizations that run competitions for schools across the country at the high school level. Um, there are for-profit and non-profit organizations that group, uh, just like there are at the state level, there are for-profit and non-profit organizations. Uh, there are ones that are ed educator-driven, and I am the chairman of, or the board member of the board of directors for an 
Vienna East Fourth Network, which we'll talk about in a second, is kind of akin to IHS again. That's how we view ourselves. We're, we're educator driven, completely volunteer organization um, that is focused on students. We're also competition focused. So some uh, groups tend to focus more on content creation and delivery. Uh, we're of the mindset that competition is important in the same reason that football, basketball, baseball competitions are important. Uh, this is just a competitive environment in a different way for students. Uh, there are also kind of adult-led structures versus student-led structures. So without getting too much into that yet, I'm again just switching hats now to my IEM board of director role. So we're a member, Snyder's a member, and there's about 85 other schools across the state that are members of the Indiana Esports Network. Like I said, Nonprofit, completely free to schools and students, 100% volunteer, educator driven. Um, I am involved after I do all of my school activities and, and all of that, and so are the other board of directors. Just because we understand that esports is important for our students and we think it can be important for other students, we have expertise to help share, but we don't think there should be a big barrier to that. We've seen this, the changes in our students' lives, and we want to share those with others. So, um, in, a, in a space that, that, that does tend to have a lot of for-profit organizations that are looking at monetizing student data, that's, that's not really what we're about at all. We don't, we don't want to sell student data in order to make ends meet, right? That's, that's why we're volunteers. We don't bring in any money, but we don't take a paycheck to it. We want to do it for the students. We do have partnerships with some other organizations as well. Um, but here's really what we're all about. You'll notice esports is a vehicle for what we really want to do. And I think that's one of the biggest things that we struggle with sometimes talking with administrators and educators about is esports is not just uh, a tiny self centered, self controlled thing. In order to really do it well, it should integrate into everything you're doing in the school. The opportunities that exist are near endless. So in Fort Wayne, one of the things that we're doing is focusing on like entrepreneurship as an opportunity. Well, esports is great for that. We have students who are doing their own research and pitches into companies and talking about, hey, well, how can we partner with you? What does that look like for us? Or they're doing digital content creation for um, our team and for our school. So this is all on the website as well. I don't want to spend tons of time there. Um, again, our purpose is really to provide an organized esports league, to offer guidance to member schools. That's a big one. Um, a lot of players in the esports space like to use the word turnkey as a solution. Um, and there might be turnkey solutions for equipment, but there's not turnkey solutions for a program. No one can just say, here's a PDF of how you run an esports program. Here you go. It's not going to work. <laughs> I mean, we've been there as educators. On the board of directors for IEM and represent almost 15 years of experience in the high school esports space. It's hard. I'm not going to lie to you. My wife's here because I get to see her, and I don't normally see her on normal days because I'm at school for 12 hours and then working at home for more. Uh, I don't want to lie to you and tell you it's easy, but it's worth it, and that's what we see as educators. So we want to provide support because we know how difficult it is, and every school is going to be in an individual situation. What works for me at Snyder won't work for you. Some of it might, but we have to discover what's going to work for you in your situation. Uh, the other big thing is providing opportunities for all students. So we've been approached by a few different organizations um, that are maybe great organizations, but there's always a contingency about cost. We, we don't want to charge students in schools for this. There's already an equipment uh, front end that you're going to have to work with. There's, there's all kinds of barriers. We don't want any of that. We want to be able to reach those students who can't afford to do something else. At Snyder, we have students who are literally homeless on our esports team. They stay after school practice because we feed them they don't have food at home. And we have students who, when we make playoffs and play at 8 p.m. at night for school on the West Coast, we have to drive to the house and pick them up because they don't have another way of getting there. Those are the types of kids that are going to be most impacted, and those are the kids that we want to make sure we reach so we don't have those financial barriers in place. So what does it actually look like to compete uh, in esports? So uh, with IEN, we have a, a fall split and a spring split. Think of this kind of like separate seasons, but we only have one state championship at the end. So we have a, 
six week split in the fall, a six week split in the spring. All the matches are online, so there's no travel involved. You're playing in other schools, roughly your same population size in online matches. Uh, there's a state ranking system that we follow. You're going to get points just like you were in normal uh, events and activities. And that leads to a state finals at the end of the season, uh, which are in person. We do believe that having in person competitions where students see each other is important, right? Part of the stigma of video games is you never see who you're playing online. If there's not a face to that person, it's really easy to degrade them and to be toxic. But all of a sudden, if you're sitting across the room from them, they're a real person. And uh, we think that an opportunity is important, but it's not realistic to travel across the state every week. So we do that at the end of the year. We do have special events and tournaments. Last year we hosted one down in Lafayette. Um, this year we'll have one in Fort Wayne and probably Lafayette as well. We also have colleges in the state who host tournaments for us, either online or in person. Um, so there are lots of opportunities. The college recruiting is a big part of it too. So just like you would have a college coach come out and maybe talk with one of your star football players or basketball players, we have college coaches come out and present to our students and talk about what the opportunities are and offer them scholarships. So all these sorts of things are, are useful. We do only play games that are rated E or T for everyone on the team. Uh, we don't dabble in anything that's rated M. Now, there's some discussion to be had there. I think it's a, a worthwhile discussion. <coughs> students are playing it anyway. Uh, <laughs> We could probably influence them in a positive way, but we're not at the point where we're doing that yet. If there's enough stigma already for some administrations, for some communities to be playing video games at all, then we're gonna focus on the everybody in the team. But like I mentioned earlier, it's not just about playing. Uh, we have students who are involved in the management aspect as well. So I have students who are Discord moderators who run my social media accounts. I have students who are doing coaching. So my varsity players will come in on their off days and coach the junior varsity and club players. Uh, honestly, they're better at it than I am. I'm not an expert in these games. Uh, most of my varsity players are better at their games than I could ever hope to be. I'm not coaching them on mechanics, but I'm coaching them on how to be a good player, or how to communicate, and those sorts of things. And they can coach each other on the mechanics. The broadcast side of things, we stream all of our matches on Twitch. Students are in charge of that production in terms of making the graphical overlay, doing the broadcast and commentary. Uh, we have students involved in all of those things. And like I said, the social media stuff as well. So uh, don't get in your mind that it's only about students sitting on a computer playing a game. That is the, the kind of nexus of it. But from that, there are all these other sorts of opportunities that arise. Uh, what does it look like at Snyder? A little self-promotional plug. I like this. Uh, here's our mission statement. I love throwing this at people because notice it doesn't say anything about video games at all. That's not what we're about. Video games, esports are a vehicle for all these other changes that we're looking to accomplish. That was one of the big selling points. We started in uh, 2019. My principal actually came to me in November and said, hey, congratulations, you're starting an esports team. I said, okay. Uh, we went from there. So. We were just about ready to start uh, first competition in March of 2020. I think we all know what happened then. So we got our computers in and they sat empty in a room for five months until we came back to school and then got ready to compete. Uh, our first season was fall of 2020. We had a partnership with a local tech company called Aptera. Their CEO is a graduate of Snyder. He employs about 18 Snyder graduates, so it's a perfect fit. Uh, they gave us some startup funding. They bought every kid in Jersey and brought in their, their employees and really connect with our students. That was a great thing to start off with. Unfortunately, they got bought out by a company who since got bought out by a company. So we're looking for a new sponsor. Uh, in that first season, this is the crazy part. We saw national success. So we competed in the National Rocket League competition. Uh, our, our team of freshman boys went all the way to the national championship match. They got national runner up to uh, Poly Prep Country Day School in Brooklyn, New York. Guess how much it costs for a fifth grader to go there? You're right, $55,000 a year. And my team of African American boys from downtown Fort Wayne who couldn't find a ride at my school almost beat them in the national championship, so it's pretty great. Uh, we have another student who was national runner up in Fortnite. He missed the $5,000 scholarship by one point. But uh, 
that was kind of the, the first taste of, wait, this, is, this can really be something that's big. We really have an opportunity here to do something. Uh, our success kind of grew from there. I don't want to read all the things, but uh, we competed in more and more tournaments every year, saw more and more success. We have state championships under our belt, nationals, runner-ups. Um, like I said, last year we had three seniors signed for college scholarships. Uh, one went to Ball State, one went to Edgewood College in Wisconsin, um, and one went to Siena Heights University in Michigan. This year we'll have probably five or more signed college scholarship deals. Uh, here's some pictures. I like showing pictures. This was our computer lab before we started. Um, Fort Wayne's a little bit behind the time on a lot of people. We just went one in 2019. So uh, we found ourselves with a computer lab that we didn't need anymore, which is great because the infrastructure is already there. We had power network right across the room. Uh, so that's what we started with. Um, we painted the outside too, kind of give students an idea that something was going on here. Because no matter how often you announce these courts, and I'm saying this as someone who's had a program for three years now, a student will come up to you and be like, wait, what is this? I don't know what's going on here. You have these courts. So painting the hallway helped a little bit. Um, here's what the inside looks like. We've got 20 high-end gaming stations with uh, PCs, 140 hertz monitors, some nice gaming chairs, carpeted because when we have 50 students in that room, it gets a little loud, especially when you try to shout cast. Uh, we've got some TVs in the center as well that run Super Smash Brothers. We have bulletin boards around the side that do score reports to help our students kind of see the progress they're making. Just a little fun thing. Uh, here's what it looks like when we've got students in there. Here's a pretty average day. And we've got 30 to 45 students in there every day after school. We also have morning practices, which I would highly recommend. So we start at 9.05, we're on the weird schedule, and go until 4.10. Uh, we realized, hey, kids are having trouble getting to school on time. You know what we can do? We can have morning practice. They're only going to play video games in the morning. They'll get there. Uh, this is Dave Moore from Bethel. I was doing this back in the woods. Uh, he comes out every year, so do other college coaches just to talk to our students about what college is like, what opportunities there are with eSports, but also just college, because some of the students we have in eSports never thought about going to college before. Frankly, they never had an opportunity to until eSports became an option. So this is one of the things that we do as well. Uh, there's my contact info. If you want to snap a picture of that or do whatever, like I said, I can send it to you. I don't know how much time I have left, but uh, if you have questions. We can talk through one lunch while they're eating. Yeah, so if you have any like major questions that are coming up, I'm going to answer a few of them until they drag me off the side. Uh, but we'll be staying <coughs> for lunch, so you can come and talk to me at lunch or, or afterwards or whatever. So all the stuff that was in the eSports room or arena was all donated from that company? No, so we had multiple sources of funding. So yeah, they donated some money. We used some district funds from technology, and we had some school funds as well. So they were probably about three pots in this room. Um, if we, if we're totaling up everything that's in that room, our 20 computers, all peripherals, monitors, the, the carpet, the chairs, everything, probably a little shy of $50,000 total. Which sounds like a lot of money, because it is, but like I said, we're servicing 100 students. And some people walk at that and I'm like, how much do you spend on a tennis court that you have eight kids play? We've got 100 students the year round that we're impacting with these sports. So, yeah. Talk a little bit, if you have a minute, um, about how you select your players for actual competition. Yeah, we have full tryouts just like you would in these four. So we compete in uh, seven different games. So one of the one of the kind of mysteries of esports is people call me a head coach. I, I'm not a head coach. I'm a director, um, and there's, there's a pretty substantial difference there. So I oversee 100 students uh, across 15 different rosters through seven different games. Um, I have assistant coaches under me who are most specialized, but you really have to look at esports as kind of a new athletic segment of your school. Um, so like we'll take Valorant tryouts. Valorant's a pretty popular first person shooter from Riot. We have 20 computers in our lab. We have uh, tryouts. I have 32 kids show up. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> But we have way more interest than we could ever hope. We do have to cut students because we just don't have the room. Uh, that, like I said, that room's full five days a week before and after school. Um, so we have full traditional tryouts like you would have normal sports. When we have rounds of cuts, 
We do have varsity, JV, and club level teams. So, for instance, for Valorant, we have 22 students who ended up making teams, but that didn't mean we had the best of So, is your lab open during the day? It is not. We have a, and this, this is kind of a difference of opinion that you see in some places. We have a completely segmented room. So, the network permissions are very different for those computers and in the other space in the building. Um, it's very controlled. We do not. Some schools have multi-purpose PCs they use for like TLTW and eSports jointly and you do some stuff there. I don't have a particular preference, so I'll just add Snyder we don't. That is dedicated only to eSports and only is open for an after school. Now I find my district technology people sometimes hiding in there because they like chairs. Uh, <laughs> but no, there are not students in there here today. Do you have any kind of integration with your regular athletics department? Uh, so it's not IHSBA sanctioned, so it's not an official athletic, but at Snyder, I report to the athletic director as well, and he is involved. He comes to our call out meeting, he talks to students and parents, we have them sign a full athletic code of conduct, so not officially, but yes. Um, and we've really seen a lot of like uh, gain from that. It gives a lot of legitimacy as, hey, this is a full athletic program. Some schools just call it a club, and they just put one teacher in a room and have some people doing some stuff, but the legitimacy really does. Yeah. Well, like I said, we'll be hanging up after the other presentation at lunch if you want to come over and ask me questions or shoot me an email. Uh, I'm compulsively attached to my email, so I'll be happy to help you out. Also, if you're interested in learning more about IEM, Indiana Esports Network, well, you can go to our website. We do onboarding calls. You can schedule a call with us, and we can talk about what that might look like at your school and I'm an offer any assistance. Hopefully that wasn't too much. Um, hopefully it was good information. So thank you for having me.